Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Nasher. I'm curator of education, Anna Smith, and today it's my pleasure to introduce artist Thaddeus Mosley. There's a quote that we've been throwing around wherein Mosley describes the alchemy of turning something neutral into something alive. And I think if you've been to our upstairs gallery, you will have seen that alchemy in action. In Mosley's hands, wood takes on the qualities of life, looming, flexing, huddling, all while bearing the marks of his work and the evidence of his expert touch. Mosley is a Pittsburgh-based artist whose sculptures are crafted with the felled trees of Pittsburgh's urban canopy via the city's forestry division. His work has been exhibited by major museums and foundations since 1959, including the Mattress Factory Museum Pittsburgh and the Carnegie Museum of Art Pittsburgh for the occasion of the 57th edition of the Carnegie International in 2018. His work is held in the public collections of museums including the Baltimore Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, the High Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Brooklyn Museum, and the Colby College Museum of Art in Waterville, Maine. He was commissioned for the 2020 edition of Freeze Sculpture at Rockefeller Center and is the recipient of the 2022 Isamu Noguchi Award. Joining Mosley in conversation is curator Catherine Kraft, who has been with the Nasher Sculpture Center since 2011. Kraft is the author of An Audience of Artists, Dada, Neo Dada, and the Emergence of Abstract Art, 2012, and Robert Rauschenberg, 2013, as well as numerous articles and reviews. At the Nasher, Kraft has most recently curated Nairi Bagramian, Model Vivant in 2022, and Nasher Mixtape in 2021. I'm very much looking forward to hearing today's conversation, so please join me now in welcoming Thaddeus Mosley and Catherine Kraft. All right. Well, thank you, Anna, and thanks to everyone for coming out on this afternoon. And most of all, thank you, Thad, for being here and for making the work on view upstairs. Um, I hope all of you have had a chance to have a look um, at the five sculptures on display. And um, Thad, I know you've been interviewed and been in conversation lots of times, so you may have heard some of the topics before, but um, yeah, it's, I'm delighted to be talking with you for a little while today. Well, I'm happy to be here, and, mm -hmm. and I'm happy that you uh, asked me to show, and, mm -hmm. and thank everyone for coming out. Yeah. You know, one of the things we do at the Nasher um, for every exhibition is we take the works that are we have on display uh, in the exhibition and we kind of put it into conversation with works from our collection. And one of the wonderful things about um, having that here is that the works, uh, there are works in our collection that correspond very closely to his own interest uh, held for a long time. If you go upstairs, you'll see um, in particular works by um, Noguchi, Brancusi, Arp, and other artists who've worked in wood from Haig to uh, Gauguin and uh, Martin Purrier. Um, you've had a, you've been working in wood and making sculpture for a very long time. Uh, well, since the I started when I was almost 30 years old, so since the late 50s, I, that's when I started, but I didn't start showing until about 59 and 60, around that, around that time, and I had my first museum show in 1966, so you see I've been chipping away for quite a while. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, and speaking of chipping away, this is uh, just to um, just wanted to start maybe with two different images. I think the the image on the left is from around 1959. That was from about 59, 58, 59, I guess. But the sculpture was probably done a couple years before that, mm -hmm. and you can see I was heavily influenced by. Uh, African tribal art, and I still 
use a lot of the influence and motifs so far as rhythm, so far as the detail, and use the gouge, gouge marks to sort of uh, direct your eye and attention to accent certain parts of the sculpture. On the right side is my studio. That picture was probably taken a couple years ago. I don't remember, I don't keep track of time too much because <laughs> it, uh, it becomes uh, letting you know that you've been here maybe too long. <laughs> so, so I try to ignore it and just keep going, but uh, yeah. but uh, you can see the early piece. I, I someone bought it in one out of the festival that I was in about that time. Yeah, and I I, I think one thing that is um, striking, and I think this is something that's well known about you, is that. You, you went to the um, University of Pittsburgh and studied journalism and English. Yeah, that's right. And, um, but then once you became interested in, in art and also in sculpture specifically, you didn't go to art school per se because you already had a family and a life. <laughs> it, well, I... Uh... I went to my own art schools. I read many, many books, and back in those days, the Carnegie Museum was free, and so I spent a lot of time going looking at the sculptures and the Gucci and Brancusi and people like that, African tribe art, trying to see how how they things were made. And I can remember one occasion, I was on the floor looking at the back of a sculpture, and the guard came over and, <laughs> and, and grabbed me, and he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm looking at the sculpture, trying to figure out how it was made. He said, well, I thought you were going to pick it up. I said, <laughs> no, it was a heavy bronze, about 500 pounds. I don't know how he thought I was going to carry it out. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, as you know, uh, of course, they're paid to safeguard the, uh, sure. the pieces so they're on the guard. And that happened to me also when Brian Cousy was having one of his last shows in Philadelphia, not him, but they were doing the exhibit. And of course, they had most of the sculpture wired off. And there was one particular piece I was trying to see the back end of it, and I was bending over the wire, and of course I was grabbed again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and of course the great thing about this show, you can walk around and see the sculpture from every angle, and uh, so it's, <laughs> Kath has done a beautiful job wow. uh, uh, setting up the work. Well, thank you, and we, um we have this big platform, and in fact, when we were installing the work at different times, I was testing it by trying to can I can I reach this? Can I touch this? So you, you don't need to you don't need to try it. It's <laughs> well, well, that, that, that's always a challenge uh, doing the in Carnegie International. Um, my uh, Ingrid decided. She, she wanted indoor, outdoor. So if you go to the far end of your building here, I had works on the outside and had works on the inside. So uh, I told him, well, you're going to have to put some deterrent of some time where people won't walk into the uh, platform. And even as it was, they had to grab a couple of little children out of the, the <laughs> exhibition. So, um, yeah. One, one thing that is, I think, to me, striking about pairing these two photos is that, um, you know, the few sculptures I've seen by you that are very early, some of them, they're representational or figurative in some way. Yeah. But, but you began, I think, pretty quickly, from what I know, to, to make 
abstract sculpture. Yeah, mainly abstract. Uh, uh, even my figures are semi-abstract because I never studied anatomy and none of that <laughs> stuff. So, uh, and everything, I've, I don't really draw, so everything I do uh, is from my mind's eye and eyeballing it as best I can. So, uh, but when it comes to the large sculptures, as you see, what's the recent one standing um, to the left of me, which is in Four. the last show at the, mm -hmm. at, at Karma, uh, uh, what, two months ago now, it was in May, it was in, in March, so yeah, two months. And, uh, so uh, the, that's very recent. What you probably see in that photograph is works I, I, I did from 2000 to 2003, which most of them were, was in the recent mm -hmm. show. Well, and that raises also the, the issue of how you make the sculptures, which is pretty much on your own. Oh, yeah. Very, very much, much on Very own. much on your yeah. own. Yeah. Um, and, and actually, I think one of the things that would be maybe nice to explore is how, how you work, how that, uh, because some of these sculptures uh, I have, I'm just, I'm going to run around um, on the PowerPoint just till I find, uh, we'll come back to the studio images of, of that, but I, one of the works upstairs, this one, um, you can see with oval continuity, first of all, you see like most of the larger sculptures um, are um, made in sections and they fit together. But the top component of oval continuity weighs, well, it, it's a, a few hundred pounds, a couple hundred pounds, few hundred uh, pounds. I, I don't think it's that heavy because... It took, it took about four art handlers <laughs> trying to get a grip on it. <laughs> I think I, just read it, I, I think I picked it up myself and put it on that. Yeah. Thing, you know. I, I think it can't be over. Well, I used to be able to pick up over 200 pounds, so I doubt if it's over 150. Okay. Uh, 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 you know, I, I think our art handlers but, but may want to have, have, have a, a word with you. <laughs> the gallery has one that's maybe almost double the size that took. Mm -hmm three of us to mount it when I was putting it on. And I can remember Tadao Aramoto, he's a woodworker, it's upstairs, he's the guy next door. So we had Tadao setting it on the pin, so he was under it. He says, are you sure this is not going to fall on me? I said, it shouldn't fall on you. I'm not going to say, it's not going to. I said, but be get ready to jump out when we drop it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it fit perfectly. It fit, but it, yeah. it, it is pretty heavy that I don't think the gallery even shows it much. They have trouble moving, you know, but I've done this such a long time and it's not always strength. You have to know how to leverage, you have to know where the center of gravity is. And, of course, me being short and stocky, I fit right in with the sculptures, you know. <laughs> but someone that's very tall, mm -hmm. they're going to have a lot of trouble because they have a long spine and so forth. And, and so they don't get as much uh, 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 power. You, know. right. you don't really see really tall weightlifters because mm -hmm. their back's not going to... At uh, last, right? You know. Well, and that also makes me think. If I go back for just a second, bear with me. Thanks. Okay. If we have a look um, at kind of on the other side of this gallery, there's a very large sculpture by Raoul Haig. Yeah. And the, you saying that makes me think he was also a fairly short but very strong um, person, and he also worked. Uh, pretty much by himself yeah. as as well. Um, I just wonder with the sculpture in the center of the platform, um, this work, Opposing Parallels, I, one thing I'm really interested in is whether 
when you're making a sculpture, and I mean, this is, you know, three pieces. You see it kind of being yeah. put together. Do you have a, a sort of, you work, you said you don't work with, um, you know, from sketches, do you have like a um, an idea in mind when you start with a piece of wood or several pieces of wood? Uh, well, it, when I, uh, the process usually starts with me laying out a couple or finding one very unique log and <laughs> and seeing what else I can get to accent that that log. And as you see, the top piece. That, that is the main log, and everything else, first, first thing I have to explain, uh, my concept is weight and space. So the uh, sculpture should seem like it's levitating. There should be movement all around, no matter where you turn or where the sculptures turn, there should be a feeling of, the levitation should continue, it should never be static. Sometimes it is, but that, that is the premise. And that was, I, so when I start out, I find either two things or one thing that's gonna make this piece move and have vitality and, and hope, hopefully be dramatic uh, in space. So, uh, so I needed, the the, the 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 platform so i made the big base on the bottom and then cause i took a lot of the wood out because you also want to reduce some of the space but you want to maintain the stability okay. so the the big issue here was getting the middle piece to, uh -huh. to, that sort of uh, um, was a combination of both shapes. So the middle piece gave me more problems than anything else, because the first thing is, it has to be stable, e equally stable as the bottom, so it'll support mm -hmm. the floating top piece. So that is what, uh, but I've been doing this so long that I can usually uh, always find the center of gravity with my eye. And I know where the empty space is, that's the center of gravity. So everything has to be focused in there. And um, of course, like I said, I, I used to teach every summer for about 30 years down near falling water. And I, as you go over and over this, so people always, you know, I, I had people mainly interested in just making a single form. But when someone sees double or triple form, everyone wants to do the same trick, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I would just try to get them to understand what the center of gravity is, and sometimes it's invisible. It's always invisible. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, people said, have you ever had anything fall on you? I said, many times. Uh, but I have a hard head, you know. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, and you, mm -hmm. you always duck, uh, get up, because none of this yeah. is, uh, so there's all sorts of joinery, there's uh, mortise and tenon, there's pins, there's dovetails, but they're not cut in until the piece is finished. The, okay, yeah, so for example, in this piece down at the bottom, you can see a little, um, Butterfly, or yeah. but one of, our um, Mike from Karma was calling it a bow tie. <laughs> yeah, they do call them bow ties That's and butter awesome. tie mm -hmm. flies. Well, that keeps the, mm -hmm. the this wood is green and it's always splits, which we call checks. And those who are familiar with George Nakashima's furniture, his daughter runs it now, Mira. And in green wood, you always have splits, and and to keep it from the wood expanding more, you make a butterfly or a bow tie so it doesn't uh, widen any any more. And so, um, unfortunately, it works because this wood comes from a very damp area, where there's a lot of moisture. It, it, down there in the mountains, and so the, the wood 
if you cut one of those logs and you set them up on the floor, you're going to have a pool of water when you first cut oh, them. Really? <laughs> so that water, so when you put these sculptures, if they're new in light, in heat, they're going to really expand because the water, you know, nothing defeats Mother Nature, you know. Yeah, that was one thing that surprised us also. I was show, telling you about this yesterday when we were installing some of the sculptures and we had photographs of them, you know, so that we could do our condition reports and see if there are any changes. And there are, you know, there were some cracks running through and the cracks were gone <laughs> or much smaller. And you were, you had a, an interesting kind of explanation of, of how that could be. Uh, oh, well, you know, it's wood is organic. Of course, this sort of wood is kiln dried, so there's very, uh, hardly any moisture in it, uh, you know. But this wood always has moisture, uh, uh, and as it's always affected by light and heat. And I've had pieces that I used to use the beeswax in the cracks. And sometimes in the summer, the cracks would come together and squeeze the beeswax out. Mm -hmm. And so the, mo the, the wood is still alive in a way. And um, so the one piece that's called Tatum Scales, yeah. uh, from it being shown, uh, it's gone, it opens a little bit, sometimes it goes back together. So I noticed that the top has gone back together somewhat. Yeah. It's the, the tall element, this photo doesn't show it so well, maybe back at the beginning it does, that um, one side of it really opens yeah. up. Let's, all right, let's see if there's one that, no, nah, there's a little, you can see a little bit of it from that side. <laughs> yeah. but, um, Actually, for, for some of those sculptures, well, I guess one question I have coming out of that is, is that ever a problem with how the sculptures fit together? If, if, if it was with you have this organic thing that can change? Well, uh, actually, most of the, uh, the fits are in the solid wood mm -hmm. and in thicker parts. So, and then they're pinned, or they're, if they're dovetailed, they're, fit, they're, they, they're fitted so they always have a little movement so they'll go together. Mm -hmm. And if there's too much movement, I have a steel pin. And the pin works two or three different ways. One thing is it, it, it'll always go back the same way. Whereas if you just have it notched, it yeah. can move at different angles. So if you, when, when you have a pen, it always goes mm -hmm. on, on that way. But I always remember what Brad Cousy said, well, if you're looking at the checks, you're not looking at the sculpture. So uh, mm -hmm. concentrate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Don't look at the splits in the wood. Look at the form. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then... Um so if you're, t well, actually, you said that often an idea for a sculpture will start when you see a particular piece of wood. Yeah. And at this point, I mean, if you're getting, uh, you, you're getting your trees or your pieces of wood from um, mainly kind of the park uh, forestry. No, no. Uh, years when I go, yeah. I, when I first started, I would get it from the city forestry division, people that, cut down the parks, uh, the old trees in the parks, and when there was a storm, or the, the places were uh, diseased and falling down. But as I um, got a little better at this, I, and got more particular, I would buy wood, and down where I say in, in southwestern Pennsylvania, and there, everyone knows where falling water is or about where it is. There's four or five sawmills down there. So I could go down and pick out the wood or he could call me and tell me what he, what he has. And so I focus on hardwoods, 
walnut and cherry. Uh, two different colors, but very uh, solid woods where you can make designs. You can uh, uh, use very tiny tools if you want to. You can almost draw with the tools, with the V gouges and so forth. So uh, I, most of the things you'll see is walnut because at this period of time, when I bought the, those 30 logs or so, um, there was more walnut available because most of the cherry wood was being sold in China and Japan because one thing here, they, we have very large trees and a lot of countries they don't have it. I can remember when we did the Sculpture International uh, Conference in Pittsburgh and, and all the people from other countries were riding on the barges and they were looking, look at the trees, look at the trees, <laughs> because in other countries, particularly in Pennsylvania, there's lots and lots of trees. <laughs> and so when you're picking out, um, you said you would pick out trees, I mean pick out or pick out wood, um, was that, is that kind of the moment where you look for things that catch your eye also in terms of the form? Uh -huh. Oh yeah, I start, uh, when I'm down at the sawmill looking, I'm, I'm forming sculptures with the trees on the logs on the ground. I see some mm -hmm. things, sometimes I tell them, if I don't go down, I say, do you have any uh, curved logs? Mm -hmm. And he'll say, yeah, I have three or four. I said, well, bring them in. The one of the pieces I called Path of the Pendulum that was in the last show resulted for me just getting, having that, an idea to do something with curved <laughs> logs. But sometimes there's a log with some peculiarities and I look and see how, uh, how, how they may uh, use with something else. But the main thing is I buy mostly straight logs and large logs because you have to have something that, uh, where these things will, uh, will be set and be stable. Right, that might be a good time to look at some images from your studio. Yeah, so but that's, that's, a, that's a, a very large log a big... and I'm, someone I guess is interviewing me or asking me and this is about a 14 foot log that's curved and there's a piece that fit on top and this was in the last about Carnegie International about four years ago and and they had a hard time fitting that top part onto the another seats three or four sections actually I had to take a bottom out so it would sit in side the Carnegie was so tall went up to about about 16 17 feet and but you had to get the up two three foot more to drop the top that part down to the other part and they were having a terrible time two two big tall guys about six one six two they couldn't fit it over the top they said Are you sure this works I said, sure. <laughs> sure, it works. We, we two of us, just two of us, took it outside and stood it up. So I never, I, I never exhibit anything that I'm not comfortable that is stable and will stand. So I said, well, let me get up on the ladder. And of course, at that time when I was. 92, and they said, uh, are you sure you can get on the ladder? I said, of course I can get on the ladder. I got on the ladder outside my studio to put this up. I said, just hold the ladder. And they said, well, can you handle the piece? I said, oh yeah, I got it. And I said, we just, just drop it down and, and fit it in. And so that's what we did. And of course, it stood up for six, seven months during the whole exhibition. But you, you know, um, un unless you do some of these things, they look a little uh, weird and impossible. But uh, 
as you see, people are always curious, do I work on the piece uh, 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 vertically? No, it's carved horizontally. You see the cradles that they sit on, and that's why <laughs> I was telling Catherine, well, when I used to teach, it, and I would have a cradle, people would get a log. I had everyone make one of these uh, cradles. I have two or three in my studio, because sometimes if, if uh, I made a sculpture for the city uh, convention center, it's 18 foot long, so I had to have double or triple. Today, the 18 foot log down to, to carve. And um, uh, so I said, people always lay the log down and they grab a chair. And I said, no, oh, you can't do this sitting down. <laughs> You're gonna have to be able to move around the log, and also the idea of the triangular form. You can turn the log. You can keep mm -hmm. turning and chalking and turning. On the far end, on the picture on this right, you can see the other end uh, where this mm -hmm. part fits over the top of that. Uh, you, you mentioned chalking. Is that also? Okay, that's my drawing. Okay. So you, you put you put chalk that marks where you want to where, where you want to carve in. Move the wood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Sometimes it's different colors because one is a deep cut, the other is a shallow cut. But it's just a little personal system that an untrained person has figured out for themselves. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a pretty good system to me. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing we've had since you've been here, some discussions about tools. <laughs> yeah. Um, our wonderful education department is getting some tools um, to, that will let people see how that works. And um, there's very particular types of tools that are used and not used. So, um, you were talking about most of the ones sitting on this table are gougers. Gougers, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about, because I think a lot of people have this idea, like if you're making sculpture, you're just going to, you know, you're with a, a chisel. Uh, and, uh, yeah, well, uh, there are a few chisels if you want to make straight cuts. Right. But also the re removing wood, uh, I think on the end you'll see a bent gouge. And the idea of that is if you're, carving, you want to make a shape that comes back up. With a straight gouge, you'll just keep going straight. With a bent gouge, it'll come back up. And particularly if you're making people that uh, make uh, bowls and things like that, that's a bent on the end. The other are different depths and, and different widths. And of course, if you're carving a large log, I, I have uh, particularly, on the average, I use a two or three inch gouge. And, and of course, you need more muscle power, but you move a lot more wood. So, but that gives you, and I was sort of laughing because the woman that was, works in education, she had a display of tools and they were carpenter tools. <laughs> And I said, well, this happened to me. I did a workshop years ago for Memphis College of Art. And of course, very few schools now have any carving stone or wood. So when I got down there, they had car carpenter tools. And I said, well, that's good if you're, you're shaving off the top of the wood, but it's no good. They're, they aren't uh, wood carving tools. And so uh, there's a place called Woodcraft, and it's headquartered pretty close to Pittsburgh, a little town called Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania. The older people who remember a singer named Perry Como, uh, <laughs> and another singer named Bobby Vinton, they both came, came from Cannonsburg. <laughs> so, uh, but that's where, uh, 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 that's the company I buy most of the 
my tombs from, and they're Swiss and English tombs. Mm -hmm. But you can see some of them are taped on the end to keep the wood, it wouldn't handle for splinting. Some have metal for rules on the end, which is even better. But in order to make more money, they don't put metal on all the ends of the wood. Mm -hmm. So I tape them to keep them from cracking so much because I hit rather, rather hard and strenuously to remove. You'll see some of the chips in the background yeah. where as a result there's quite a pile, of There's quite a pile there as, as well. But I think, I think the, the question of tools is interesting also because your sculptures tend to have this incredible surface. Uh -oh. And uh, let me go to one that really shows that. I mean, that's just one example. It's just these, this series of kind of inflected marks and light mm -hmm. really catches the surface. So in, in part, that's from the gougers. Yeah, gouge marks. Mm -hmm. We also have, very, have gouges, you know, like uh, uh, an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, if you're doing very small details, but also have things that are very curved because if you're doing an end grain, you're not going to cut very deep with a, a flat chisel. You need something like that that will go through an end grain or go through a knot. But also, the gouge marks set a design in, in, in the sculpture and direct your wood. I, like I said, one of my influences is tribal arts. And in tribal art sculpture, you'll see where, where the carving marks direct your eye up, left or right, or, or in. So all those uh, marks they create not only create a rhythm, but direct your eye as to where the sculpture is going. I mean, you know, one of the things, um, if we think about how the works are made, and we've talked quite a lot about that. Um, what what is it that? I guess you know you could also be making furniture. I guess. Oh, but, I made but what it. Do you, yeah. What 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 about for for you and like making sculpture? What is what do you get out of it? I I guess. Or what are your feelings about um, what what keeps you making sculpture at this point? Well, of course, I started making sculpture for myself, and I guess I still am making it for myself. <laughs> but I, I think it's a, a lifestyle. I think, to me, there's nothing uh, more joyful or exhilarating is having living surrounded by art, and to me, having a, a really. Uh, 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 beautiful pieces of sculpture in your house or living with it. And I think living with art, it, to me, is very important. Uh, I always feel very happy people who were moaning during the pandemic about their uh, surroundings, their environment. I didn't have that problem. Uh, <laughs> I have about maybe 50 pieces of uh, sculpture in my house, not only mine, a lot of other people. And I enjoy seeing, I, it's living with this. And, and I think that for a lot of people, these are inanimate things, but to me, they're always alive. And that's what organic art means to me, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um Part of the, the sort of lifestyle that you're describing also encompasses or is close to jazz. And I can't mm. resist, uh, <laughs> I can't resist bringing in jazz while we have the chance to, to talk because that's a, also really a major part of well, your I've life been, and your work. <laughs> well, I've been sort of a, uh, well, I came from a musical family, had an older sister who was a singer. And the first jazz, musician I ever saw, I guess I was about eight years old, and um, Blanche Calloway came to Newcastle. Now, very few people know who Blanche Calloway was, but they know who Cab Calloway was. 
And Lance Calloway was Cab's older sister, and he imitated her a great deal. And uh, and then the next band I saw was Ella Fitzgerald and Chick Webb. And Ch mm -hmm. Ella Fitzgerald was maybe about 17 or 18 years old at that time. And I always, uh, of course, Pittsburgh has produced so many great jazz people, and a lot of them I knew very personally were good friends, like the recent departed Alma Jamal. I knew him since he was a teenager, and every time he came home, uh, we always went to dinner. My friend Terry and I, he'd always have us uh, over for, for dinner and whatnot. So I saw many now. You might notice I'm wearing a cap from the Village Vanguard. They're not paying me to wear, to advertise for them, but it's just one of my favorite caps. And every time we go to New York, one of the places we go is to the Va Village Vanguard. And uh, we recently was there with Joe Lovano, Paul Douglas Band. And so, and of course I play music every day I have a lot of mu fair amount of music in the studio, but I must have close to thousand CDs and records in my house, which is a small amount to some friends of mine who have <laughs> yeah, a, a great great deal or more. But uh, so uh, music and art, which music is an art. I think when you surround yourself and make music and art a lifestyle. To me, I'm always happy. I have a friend that supports, and sometimes he's down. He says, well, what do you do to get going in the morning and all like that? I said, well, when I get out of bed and I'm feeling all right, I have a little painting in my hallway and I hit that painting to do my little dance, I'm ready to go. I said, but when I come downstairs, if I'm not feeling really great, I said, I put on Art Blakey. Art Blakey is from Pittsburgh. I knew him very well. Norma, you can't find a more exuberant man than Art Blakey in person. But also, when Art Blakey played, if you played with me, you had to get up and go. <laughs> I, I remember one time there was a, a young trumpet player was playing with him, and of course, the Crawford Grill, and it's one of the main stages it was way back for many years. And Art was home and playing, and this guy was sort of fluttering with it on his soul. And, Art hard, get your foot out that hole. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, it's live and art's live and jazz is live. I think it's the greatest America, uh, music America has produced and certainly a lot more, uh, other countries are more appreciative of of, of our musicians than we are, unfortunately, you know. I remember when Art went to Japan and Freddie Hubbard and all of them, and they, the ambassadors came out and they had women giving them flowers as they were coming, and Freddie Hubbard started crying. And he said, this is for us. He says, in America, this does not happen. Uh, but it happened that uh, they appreciated what geniuses they were and what great artists they were. Well, we <laughs> definitely appreciate you. And <laughs> you saying that also makes me think about, uh, I asked you what you were going to do when you're done with your trip here. <laughs> well, I, I, of course, the studio has been calling me since I've landed. As a thing I'm working on, I want to get finished. And another thing I have in view. And uh, so usually, if you're talking about furniture, when I can't think of anything else to make in between large sculptures, I always make stools. And well, I made one to go with one of the sculptures here in the show. You can yeah. see it on the far end. Of course, you can see it better there. But um, but that's what I do. Um, uh, uh, 
I, I always enjoy making stools, trying to see how many different ideas I can come up with. And they're very utilitarian and, uh, and nice to have around. Yeah, I think um, we could go on and on, but I also feel yeah. like I want to give um, other people here a chance to ask questions if they, if anybody has questions here. If somebody, I think at the back. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Mosley, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. Thank you for yeah. being here. Uh, I was recently uh, in Pittsburgh um, and saw some of your work there, particularly in the hill countries, uh, in the hill um, section of the city. That, um, and I want to ask you about, um, you know, particularly that hill district, uh, particularly because this uh, place, uh, the Nasher, is close to another uh, black, uh, former black community, the Freedman's Town. Um, and I'm interested in, in what you see happening now in Pittsburgh uh, in relation to the art that's there, particularly the Phoenix and other arts? Well, uh, it, there's always been, where, wherever people are, all kinds of people, there's always been someone that spearheaded some sort of an art movement and art community. So the, the hill, isn't what it was in the old days. The, the clubs aren't what they uh, were, and neither are they in New York. When I go to New York, I have a hard time sometimes finding, uh, like, who's that smoke? But in the old days, I, I think when you went to Harlem, there was lots of clubs, but there's hardly any there now, which is sort of pathetic. <laughs> Bennett's so-called Afro-American music was the, uh, the, the impetus of this. Of course, now it's a world music, which is uh, I'm happy about. But in, in, the, in the Hill, uh, uh, they have struggled to, uh, to, to revive a lot of the stuff that used to be there, uh, like um, Franco Harris, was trying to revive the grill, but he recently passed away. So I don't know if that's uh, 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 going to happen. But there are a few people like um, Earl Reynolds and Catherine Carr. They've started with the Mocha, uh, uh, um, a gallery uh, learning center. And they've just getting, uh, of course, everything was stymied during the COVID. Uh, so we'll see how much new really comes up. Uh, There's some other questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I watched a video a couple of days ago that I guess took place in the gallery Karma. And you were talking about you were 88 years old when you got a lift in your studio. Yeah. And I was curious to know wh how you use it and what you got it for and why. Oh, well, uh, the, 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 one of the things, uh, I guess, uh, when, in my 80s, I got so I couldn't keep lifting things 50 times in a row anymore. Uh, so, uh, but if you look at the tallest sculpture. Now, the, mainly the round one that's on the first thing that uh, maybe you go back to the original uh, one with me when I was a young man on the other side. Okay, me, yeah. that top piece there uh, on the right, that weighs, I would imagine, 125 pounds. I so said there are three sections, but the top piece is one piece and about 125 pounds. And when I was young, I could lift that up by myself and fit it. But with, with, with the uh, crane, I'm able to hover it and really fit it. So when karma gets it in New York, it's not going to fall. 
<laughs> so, so uh, that's the idea of the crane. Is the is the crane? Is it power? Is it hand? Oh, it's crane, a hydraulic. Crane, hydraulic. And, mm -hmm. and very, uh, it's like me. It's very old fashioned and very <laughs> and very mechanical. There's no electric power or anything <laughs> like that. So you have complete control. You right. know, there there is there are uh, electric power tools. But once you turn on those RPMs, they don't slow down. They, 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 you're at the mercy of the electricity. But when you're working by hand, you can carve as slow as fast as you want. And the same thing with the hydraulic crane. Any other questions? So as someone who trained as a sculptor and who carved... Uh, I, you know, my hearing isn't the greatest, and you have a... Oh, a mask on, so I okay. to your muffled everybody. sound. All right. So, as someone who trained as a sculptor and who carved for about two seconds, I am very <laughs> curious because of the timing involved. I was like somebody who needed to have results quick. I'm curious about the duration when you're carving. How long does it take for you to do some of these monumental pieces? Well, most large pieces I like get about two and a half to three months. I mean, you cannot do this in a hurry, you know, and you cannot promise someone that you're going to have something done in a week, you know. At least I can't, you know. Do you, do you work on one at a time? I, I do, I'm very single-minded. Mm -hmm. I work on one thing till I get it. Mm -hmm. I have an idea, and I want to see the connections come together, and I, I. So I just work on one thing till I, I get it done. As you can see to the left there, you'll see some of the stools that I made at that time. And so sometimes I just stop and I make a series of stools and, and I try to make them all very different, hopefully. And, and sometimes people use them uh, uh, to sit on and sometimes they just use them as a art object as a sculpture. People buy a, a, a box pedestal and put the stools on top as sculpture, which they are sculpture. That's a tip from Brancusi, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Anybody? Maybe one, maybe one more question. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I just had a question. Um, when you were talking about how wet the wood is, do you carve wet and then have yeah, it hard is. dry? Are you are you kiln dry it after the process? Uh, no, well, can, when you you can't kill dry a log. If you kill dry wood, you have to cut it, you have to saw it, and put it in in in, in uh, and kill dry wood is mostly for furniture. Now, if you're going to uh, dry wood for a sculpture, it has to be air dried. So that means you have to have a place with a shed or we just put it out where it doesn't rain much. Uh, but that usually, a good sized log will take you over five or six years to, to, to air dry. I carve mainly green wood because I don't, you never know if you have another five or six years to wait for the <laughs> log to dry, you know. <laughs> All right, well, thank you everybody. and. Thank you, Thad. Well, uh, thanks for coming out. Mm -hmm.